Hello everyone, I'm Greg Weaver. Welcome to the Audio Analyst. Pardon me. Before we move into today's Guilty Treasure recording, I want to thank all my current subscribers and remind our new viewers that if you are enjoying these conversations, if you find any merit or value in the information I'm sharing here, please be sure to subscribe, like, and share links to your favorite episodes with your friends. And please leave your comments and questions. I absolutely love hearing from you. Should you wish to take a more active role in supporting the channel and in that process, receive exclusive access and content, consider becoming a patron. You'll find a wide range of Patreon subscription levels available to meet any budget or level of generosity. And if a one-time donation makes more sense for you using Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo, the necessary information is available in the comments section. I want you all to know that your support at any level ensures the continued production of these conversations and is genuinely appreciated. Thank you. Now, today I want to introduce you to one of several masterworks from Canadian singer-songwriter, guitarist, and activist, Bruce Coburn. Initially recognizable by his acoustic guitar work and lyrics that typically addressed spiritual themes and global political issues. His first decade of recordings, starting with the eponymous 1970 release, are largely literate singer-songwriter folk rock, often with a strong Christian tone or featuring mystical, almost devotional lyrics. But with his 10th record, 1979's Dancing in the Dragon's Jaw. He delivered his only real major U.S. single, Wondering Where the Lions Are, which peaked at number 21. What is most interesting to me about that release is that it demarks the obvious beginning of an expansion and augmentation of his musical style as he begins to embrace world beat rhythms an approach that would only flourish over his next several releases. In fact, starting with his next release, 1980's Humans, and coursing over the next several works, he utterly muted his Christian lyrics, partially as a way of distancing himself from the American religious right, a group whose agenda he found antithetical to his own personal beliefs, and would see him begin to focus on more humanitarian, and political subject matter. Now, to me, that 1980 release, Humans, is a pronouncement of a musician finding himself, of discovering and becoming comfortable with his inner voice. Humans starts to reveal a growing comfort with, uh, uh, and prominence, actually, with uh, uh, world, reggae, and folk rhythms that he was now routinely assimilating into his work. It also found him playing electric guitar, though in a similar finger-picking style to all his previous acoustic work. Many feel that Humans is his finest moment on record, and I can't really dispute that. It is compelling, fresh, and vital sounding in a way nothing he had done before approaches and is deserving of its own Guilty Treasure episode, and there may actually be one at some point. Considered a songwriter's songwriter, he's had songs covered by dozens of artists, from American musicians like Chet Atkins, Jimmy Buffett, Judy Collins, Jerry Garcia, Katie Lang, to Canadian artists uh, Anne Murray and the Bare Naked Ladies. And in fact, on September 23rd of 2017, he was inducted, along with Neil Young, Beau Dommage, and Stefan Venn, into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. 
Yet it is 1984's Stealing Fire, a passionate and eloquent series of sketches derived from his experiences while visiting Nicaragua and Guatemala that previous year, while traveling on behalf of the Canadian arm of the International Relief Organization, Oxfam. Recorded in March and April of that year at Mantis Studio in Toronto, Ontario, engineered by John Naslin, Stealing Fire was quickly crafted from notes and detailed observations he'd made on that trip and features exhilarating, innovative, and fresh world music influences. And it's rife with uh, lyrics describing life and circumstances in the third world. Now, the first time I heard this record uh, was shortly after its release, while I was visiting an audio salon I frequented in those days, Hi-Fi House in State College, Pennsylvania, a shop I later came to manage, actually. Uh, but it spoke to me right from the start, guys. So much so that it has not only been in regular rotation since, but it has become a staple in my reviewing arsenal, and, and for several reasons. Part of its attraction is the diversity of musical influences and instrumentation contributed by the band members. Aside from having written, played guitar, and done vocals on this recording, uh, artist Fergus Marsh, who played bass and Chapman Stick on the LP, collaborated on the music for Maybe a Poet and To Raise the Morning Star. Now, the Chapman Stick is a fascinating and unique-sounding 12-stringed instrument. It was created by Emmett Chapman in 1974, and it uses six strings on the bass side and six more on the melody side. It is played by tapping or fretting the strings rather than plucking them. The result is that instead of one hand fretting and the other hand plucking, both hands sound notes by striking the strings against the fingerboard. As a fully polyphonic chordal instrument, it can cover several musical parts at once, completing dynamic bass lines while contributing melodies. And though it vaguely sounds like a guitar, its unique voice serves to contribute significantly to the power of the world music flavor of this record. John Goldsmith, a Canadian musician, arranger, producer, and composer, probably best known in Canada for his film and television scores, has worked on various projects as both a musician playing keyboards and as a producer on several albums with Bruce and many other artists. Drummer Misha Polio and percussionist Che Sharp round out the group of players who created this amazing record. Now, first up, side one, track one, Lovers in a Dangerous Time distinctly presents Coburn's easily recognizable lyrical style and writing form and features the rather colorful line, got to kick at the darkness till it bleeds daylight. Now, if you're a U2 fan, and I'm not, not after the early, I like the early works a lot, but after Joshua Tree. Anyway, you, you may recall that Bono bastardized this line for the song God Part 2 from U2's 1990, uh, I'm sorry, 1988 release, Rattle and Hum. Uh, it came out as, I heard a singer on the radio late last night says he's going to kick the darkness till it bleeds daylight. They at least credited Coburn for this work, unlike some artists. But according to Coburn, the song was inspired by seeing teenagers expressing romantic love in a schoolyard. I don't know. In the song, he contrasts the hopefulness and joy of new love with the despair of a wider Cold War world where thoughts of the future often uh, include a sense of foreboding and doom. And right from the opening, the drums and bass set a brisk yet measured pace, and Bruce's voice enters from deep within the stage with excellent clarity. His guitar work is delicately superimposed over the bass, drums, and the unique tonalities of the Chapman stick 
while backing vocals from Joel Finney and P uh, Paul Henderson blend almost seamlessly to deliver its memorable chorus. While instrumental lines are cleanly focused with good detail, I gotta tell you, the cymbals seem somewhat slighted um, and more recessed than I would have liked to have heard. Side one, track two is a favorite. It's called Maybe the Poet. Here, the music credits include Fergus Marsh, as well as producer keyboardist John Goldsmith and producer backing vocalist Carrie Crawford. Right from the start, its angular, jazz-influenced time signature and construct are contagious. The lyrics here deal with the forceful oppression of free speech and, to my ears, as a writer, are bitterly clever. Phrases like, shoot him up with lead, you won't call back what's been said. Put him in the ground, but one day you'll look around. There'll be a face you don't know, voicing thoughts you've heard before. Brilliant. And, and everything is magically woven together with the addition of the harmonies uh, and backing vocals. Now, Canadian producer and engineer Rick Sherman is credited with the powerful ground bass effects on this track, which may be best explained as a compositional technique in which all the melodies, chords, and rhythms are built on the lowest of the music, um, the bass here. Next, side one, track three is Sahara Gold. With a slight hint of flamenco and a clear switching of locales and shifting of musical gears, from its atmospheric opening filled only by solo guitar work to the entrance of the pulse of the drums, the music clearly arouses a, a sensation of the foreign. Strings rule on this track, and the modulated yet persuasive timekeeping combined to create a soothing yet infectious pace and melody. Side one, track four, is making contact. Opening with a distinct essence of island rhythm, uh, trippingly supported by the sway of the horn section and Bruce's almost nonchalant vocals, uh, be prepared to be swept along by its infectiousness. It's so compelling and irresistible that you'll likely find yourself singing along to the chorus by the second refrain. It's a really catchy song. Closing side one with track five, Peggy's Kitchen Wall is one of my all-time favorite Coburn songs. And it actually represented one of several highlights when I last saw him perform with his son John while touring his Crowing Ignites release in Humble Hall, at the nearby Goshen College last September. The guitar leads uh, the way into the story with percussion uh, and supporting strings in tow, while mass backing vocals heighten the significance of the repeated question, who put that bullet hole in Peggy's kitchen wall? Exposing its reggae influence, bass and percussion channel the direction with guitar, other strings, keyboards, and even cymbals running on into that seductive and infectious chorus. The naturalness, clarity, and specificity captured on this track, while not flawless, has seen me using it for comparative valuations of equipment for decades now. Flipping the album over to side two, track one, to raise a morning star, is a brooding tune. Again, written by bassist uh, Fergus Marsh. Based on a timeless Australian Aboriginal mythological saying, with nicely paced rhythms established by the drums and all other instruments gracefully leaning into and supporting its calm but jazzy flow, the backing vocals add an almost ethereal and otherworldly cast. Now, there's no question the Chapman stick is the star here and you get a feel for what an incredible sonic influence the instrument brings to this song and to the entire album in general. The next three songs might possibly be considered the heart of this work. Side two, track two is Nicaragua.
Here, Bruce's folk roots conflate with the, pers the persuasive melody hewn by the strings to, to really bolster the power and poignance of the lyrical tale, which is part observational, part commentary, and part tribute to the Sandinista-led revolution in that country. With a slight Caribbean tinge, the arrangement and melodic lines are delightfully complex and rousing. Again, the Coburn lyrical style is conspicuous. Side two, track three, is the striking if I had a rocket launcher. Though it only reached 88 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts in the US, and that success was primarily due to the regular rotation of the associated music video on MTV. This is arguably Coburn's most powerful merging of personal and political feelings. Written after witnessing Guatemalan refugees being repeatedly chased across the border by gun-wielding government helicopters, it evokes not only the suffering of the people, but the inner conflict of Coburn's pacifist leanings and the anger and vengeful tendencies witnessing such an experience evoked. <laughs> Over the course of the song's four verses, his lyrics suggesting what he would do if he had a rocket launcher go from I'd make somebody pay, to I would retaliate, to I would not hesitate, to some son of a bitch would die. Guys, musically, it is an infectious cut featuring light synthesizer backgrounds, balancing the nice weight and body of the drums with the distinct and expressive musical combinations from the rest of the players to give its slow tempo and passionate guitar melody flight. Now, closing out the work, side two, track four, gives us Dust and Diesel, which may be the epitome of this album's written from notebook lyrics, relating a simple list of mundane events and impressions all brought to life by Coburn's wry wit. Gently grounding us after that previous cut and maintaining the album's signature electric guitar and Chapman stick charm, it also serves to humanize a people that Coburn saw in Nicaragua at a time when much of the rest of the world was trying to dehumanize them. Its emphasis on harmony with drums and percussion filling out its musical character and body. It is a lazing literary treasure and a wonderful close to an album teeming with rich musical appeal. Once you hear it, while clearly not a perfect recording, the degree to which it captures the vitality of the music, imparting it with reasonably honest weight, tone, and texture, combined with refined clarity and in individuality to both individual instrumental lines and human, human vocals, I think you may agree that it is clearly a better than average recording. For his efforts on this subtle masterpiece, Mantis studio engineer John Naslin received the 1984 Canadian Juno Award as Recording Engineer of the Year. And producers John Goldsmith and Carrie Crawford were nominated for Producers of the Year. Now, while much of its lyrical context must be acknowledged as politically charged, Stealing Fire presents a compelling and engaging view into that time. It is a diverse and extraordinarily musical treasure and represents the work of an artist at his peak, containing, in my opinion, some of the most intensely significant, important, and engaging music delivered to the world by any singer-songwriter in the 1980s. Guys, it's an enchanting creation, one that I hope you will come to enjoy as much as I do. Now, guys, to be honest, I've only heard a handful of releases, um, uh, including the original 1984 Canadian True North uh, LP, uh, TN57. Um, it's not, uh, it, it's absolutely my favorite LP at this point. Um, now I, I also have the original Gold Mountain US CD. Um, I think it's, uh, GM80012. Uh, my favorite CD without question is the 2003 US Rounder reissue. 
um, and it's really pretty good. Uh, you'll find it um, used. It's not available new anymore, I don't think. Um, and honestly, the Cobuzz 16-bit uh, 44 kilohertz stream, which seems to be from the 1991 U.S. Columbia CD release, CT48735, uh, is really good as well. Um, and I've included a link to that stream in the comments. Now, while the True North LP and the Rounder CD are my preferred versions, honestly, at this point, the others all still get my thumbs up. They're really not bad recordings at all. Um, and uh, they're, uh, check it out. You're, you're going to love this CD. Um, with that, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks for taking the time to drop by and visit today. Remember to subscribe and to like and share your favorite episodes, as well as to post your comments and questions. Please stay safe and keep the music playing, won't you? Till next time, guys. Cheers.